thanks so much. I appreciate it. I appreciate the invitation to be here. And I appreciate the talks that came before me because they very well set up some of the issues that I'm going to, that I needed to be in the background of today's talk because I didn't quite have enough time to um, discuss them. So keep all of these discussions in mind as we move forward. In the fall of 2003, paleoanthropologist Peter Brown emailed his colleague Chris Stringer, pictured here, to discuss a new find that he had just spent 10 days examining, reconstructing, and puzzling over, as he put it. Brown was hoping for a sounding board to get around some difficult issues that the unexpected discovery raised as he prepared to publish on it. He told Stringer that the new hominin that had been found was an obligate biped with an endocranial volume of only 380, approximately 1.3 meters tall, and not from Africa. Adding, quote, if I said that nothing like this had ever been found before, it would be an understatement. Stringer's first impression was that this was, quote, a fantastic specimen. The bones they were discussing had just been discovered a few weeks prior in a cave in Indonesia. A team of archaeologists looking for evidence of modern humans, Homo sapiens, in the cave had unexpectedly stumbled upon something quite different below the surface of the cave floor when they unearthed this individual. What they had, been, what they had found, as Brown had given Stringer a teaser of, was a small-brained creature, short in stature, with a mixture of primitive traits that were generally associated with human ancestors and relatives more distant in time, like those that we've heard about this morning, but also with some traits that were associated with more modern humans. Additionally, the specimen was found in a context that suggested quite modern, perhaps even advanced behaviors, including being found nearby stone tools, and even the skeleton's sheer existence in time and place, specifically in the very recent past, as we're gonna see today. Later, that same object would be assigned a range of fictional identities, from a hobbit who lived in holes across the misty mountains of Middle Earth, a peaceful but courageous people, to a legendary wild grandmother of the forest, a tiny hairy people who once roamed the tropics of Indonesia alongside modern humans, eating everything from crops to human babies. Stringer's claim of fantastic then was more accurate than he probably realized at the time. The specimen was indeed fantastic, though in two senses of the word. One was a sense that Stringer meant tremendous, remarkable, extraordinarily good. And the second was the original meaning for the word fantastic, imaginative, fanciful, removed from reality. As opposed as these two meanings might sound, in the case of this scientific object, they were not always entirely separate, but instead intertwined, I would like to argue today. When the find was published the following year, it made an enormous splash. Brown's team declared that the specimen was a new species of hominin named Homo floresiensis, and it was front page news in the science world, though even nature couldn't help but make a joke about it. The press also enjoyed the discovery, which had been nicknamed the Hobbit by the discoverers themselves for that short stature though apparently not all of those in the press and the artist got the memo that the specimen was believed to be that of a female. For this talk, I want to use the creative nature of this theme today to explore Homo floresiensis as both a scientific object and a fantastical legend that many images are built upon, asking what is it about these particular bones that has them practically dancing on the line between science and myth. The way I'll structure this talk, so you have a roadmap of where I'm headed, is I will first review the object in more detail so we can see why Stringer called it so fantastic. And then we'll turn to the legend of the Ibu Gogo, the wild grandmother of the forest, as an example of one of the many myths about the fossil. And then I'll sort of talk about what we've learned ever since, which has helped disentangle the legend from the object a little bit. And finally, I'll speak to why I think this matters and what we can take away from it for the science of paleoanthropology. 
Just a caveat as we get going, not only is this particular exploration of science and myth a bit of a newer experiment for me, but also any 30-minute discussion of homo forensiensis is necessarily a little bit limited. So the talk is quite focused. Um, although I'm always happy to talk about other aspects of homo forensiensis, either later in the day or any time. Um, those who know me know that I could talk about homo forensiensis all day, but I'm not gonna do that. <laughs> So let's go ahead and get to know the object, which is so beautifully displayed here by one of the archaeologists that led the discovery team, Dr. Thomas Sutikna. And let's locate ourselves in space, just so we know where we are, um, especially given that we've seen the relationship to Africa is already a theme uh, in the story of Homo Fresiensis. So here's Indonesia here. You can see quite far away from Africa. And if we zoom in to this island nation. We see Flores is right in the middle here, more or less. And if we zoom in again on Flores into the mountains of western Flores, we find the cave of Liangbua. This is a cave that's been a productive archaeological site for many decades, with scientists searching for evidence of modern humans, homo sapiens there. And even this picture on the right is a photo of excavation from the late um, 1980s, from the archives, before I was born. Uh, in the early 2000s, the team started digging the previously excavated pits deeper than they'd ever gone into the cave floor before. And that's when they found, almost six meters deep, the specimen which became labeled LB1 for Liang Buo 1. Once the specimen was removed from the ground and back in the lab, a couple things started to become clear. Like Pithecanthropus, there were a mixture of features that were intermediate, some that were considered quite primitive, and some that were considered quite modern. We've heard quite a bit about limb proportions already today, and the limb proportions are one thing that came out of the analysis of this fossil, that this creature had long arms in comparison to, the le to their legs. You can also see there's kind of a heavy brow ridge in the side view, which is thought to be a more primitive feature. And this was jarring, as Brown was mentioning in that original email. It jarred in location. What he didn't know, Brown, when he wrote that email, was that it jarred in time as well. The dates were about to come out. Once the team analyzed the layers of the cave, and they interpreted them to understand when this fossil had been deposited, they suggested that Homo fresiensis had lived very recently in time saying that it had gone extinct between 12 and 18,000 years ago, which is practically yesterday in paleoanthropological terms, when we're used to talking in 3.57 million years. Now, that date has since been revised, as we'll see later in this talk, but first let's ask, what does that actually mean, either the original dates or the revised dates? This young date meant that Homo fresiensis had walked the Earth at the same time as modern humans. Here is just a small piece of the family tree that was imagined by a couple of the scientists in 2004, um, just to begin to illustrate how odd this concept was at the time. Now, a lot has changed since 2004, which we'll see today, but I think what we can see from this image is that the family tree was thought to be a little bit bushier the further back you went into time. We've heard a little bit about that today, more like millions of years ago. But as we got to the more recent past, it was thought that it was pretty much just us, Homo sapiens, and Neanderthals for a little while. But this young date that was originally interpreted for the fossil suggested that Homo fresiensis had likely overlapped in time with Homo sapiens and Neanderthals, and possibly even in space with modern humans, Homo sapiens, because we know modern humans were in the area. Indeed, that's why the team was digging there at the time. Okay, but what does this have to do with the wild grandmother of the forest, the Ibu Gogo? To get a clearer picture of that, let's move to part two, which is the legend. The Ibu Gogo is an old folktale on the island of Flores, which was first documented in English a couple of decades ago by an ethnographer at the University of Alberta, Gregory Forth, who said that the people of Flores have a myth about a small woman of the forest who is long-armed, and it's even said that she has, um, that she eats everything around her from crops to occasionally human babies if she's hungry, and that she has long pendulous breasts that she throws over her shoulder when she runs away after 
um, eating crops and creating such mischief. Associations between the Ibu Gogo and Homo Floresiensis arose immediately after the Hobbit news broke. Headlines asked, could these two creatures be one and the same? Had the locals been imagining mythical people of the forest, as it was originally assumed, or had they been reporting them? Perhaps the seemingly fictitious legend had an empirical basis all along, preserved in oral record. The press ran with this idea of a connection between Ibu Gogo and Homo floresiensis, but scientists too entertained it, including some geologists and the ethnographer Forth, who had originally documented it in English. The press soon even began asking if a living, breathing Homo floresiensis Ibu Gogo hybrid, same thing, could be found in some remote part of the island of Flores today. Now, oh, I had a question that at the end of that, that it won't quite let me get to. Stay tuned. Okay, so my question is why? <laughs> What's going on here? Why is the story of Ibu Gogo so powerful in the context of Homo floresiensis? But before I answer that, I wanna just briefly pause to say that I'm not trying to dismiss folklore today or even suggest that folklore and scientific knowledge are necessarily two distinct entities. Far from it, in fact. I think this talk aims to explore the opposite, how these things are entangled and what they can learn from one another. Indeed, this type of conversation across indi indigenous knowledge, including oral record and science, is happening more broadly around the world, with practitioners of the historical sciences, for example, beginning to ask questions about how far back in time oral traditions can reliably, accurately report events, for example, volcanic eruptions, sea level rises, things of this nature. And so <clears throat> the interplay, I think, between science and myth has become more complex in recent years and more interesting. What are the boundaries between legend, oral memory, myth, and science, if there are clear boundaries, indeed. For me, the question is not one necessarily of distinction, but trained as a historian and philosopher of science, the question is more of what does the exploration of these different ways of knowing tell us about the science itself? How do we make sense of objects that seem to sit in that liminal space between science and myth, like the specimen of LB1? In this particular story of Homo floresiensis, the exploration of the connection between myth and legend became pretty interesting. Forth argued that anthropologists are often too inclined to dismiss folk categories as products of the imagination. Others pointed to correlations between the description of Ibu Gogo and Homo floresiensis. For example, both were described as having long arms and being small in stature. Others still were intrigued by the legend's detail. Surely, they thought, the vivid description of those pendulous breasts that the Ibu Gogo allegedly threw over her shoulders must be compelling enough to make this a case of reporting rather than mere storytelling. At one point, Forth even publicly lamented that, quote, the dimensions of the female breasts is unfortunately one of the many things that cannot be gauged from the paleontological evidence. However, there were some weak links in this proposed connection as well. To begin with, the two concepts exist in actually different regions of Flores. The Ibu Gogo story belongs to the Naga people who reside more than 100 kilometers across treacherous mountains and thick jungle forests from the cave of Liangbua. The Hobbit cave is instead home to the culturally and importantly linguistically different people known as the Mangarai. And while it's not impossible to imagine that a Homo floresiensis Ibu Gogo may have ranged across different parts of the island, it is a bit suspicious that Ibu Gogo is not a Mangarai equivalent and that they have no um, equivalent, or it's not a Mangarai invention and they have no equivalent. Also, a quick glance across this archipelago reveals that stories of small forest creatures are not terribly unique to Flores which is perhaps unsurprising because this is an area that's rife with living human-like primates. The well-known Orang Pendek, for example, short people of, the nearby, Sum of nearby Sumatra, are thought to be accounts of orangutans. And while Flores has no orangutans, there are plenty of macaques. Yet, 
Expeditions went out endeavoring to find a still living Ibu Gogo Homo floresiensis, hoping to gaze into the bestial eyes, and local villagers too began reporting having killed them, inviting reporters and scientists from around the world to come see. In 2015, even a mockumentary that was, quote, inspired by real scientific discovery, played with fact and fiction around this topic. The film, called Cannibal in the Jungle, told the story of a brutal cannibalized murder in the forest of Flores, blamed on a foreign researcher who swore it wasn't him, but was instead the, sm the fault of a small beast of the jungle. The researcher, who was due to spend his life in jail, was vindicated years later, only after the discovery of Homo floresiensis and the realization that the crime had, in fact, been committed by Ibu Gogo. Playing with fact and fiction in this mockumentary, it mixed genuine footage of the Hobbit excavations at Lingbua and interviews with real scientists and experts whose comments about the exceptional fossil discovery were woven into a fictional narrative using eccentric actors and fake newspaper headlines. So what are we supposed to make of this mixing of science and imaginary, or of the legend of Ibu Gogo? Well, this is where I think the crossover between the two types of fantastic is actually really interesting. I think some culpability for why people were out searching for wild people of the forest lies in the bones themselves. The reason, or at least part of the reason, that this line in the two fantastics got blurred is because the fossils were so fantastic in Stringer's meaning of the world word. They were so great and unexpected. In doing so, they overturned basic assumptions about the past. The fantastic specimen shook the foundation enough to open the door to ask questions about what scientists and experts think that we know about our origins. It, it caused them to re-examine some of their assumptions that they had been walking around with about brain size, for example, and some of those early evolutionary characteristics. I think this is especially apparent in the issue of the coexistence of modern humans and hobbits. Again, if we think back to that image from 2004 of the piece of the family tree, it was basically just humans and Neanderthals living in the recent past. Homo floresiensis shocked scientists by telling us that another species had lived in the past. Now, this image, done by the Natural History Museum of London and Chris Stringer, shows us, reminds us that since the discovery of Homo floresiensis, more discoveries have come out that show that the human family tree was in fact quite bushy in the recent past. But I think this is a difficult thing for us to grapple with both scientifically and um, emotionally, I guess, because we are now the only species of human walking around. And we're just now learning, especially since Homo floresiensis, that that really was not the case. And I think that's where you start to get an overlap of asking whether or not wild people of the forest are around and what we make of this fantastic specimen. Ultimately, though, the holes in the Ibu Gogo Homo floresiensis association grew too large to be ignored. And this is how we reach part three. Each expedition in search of a reported sighting of a living Ibu, Ibu Gogo revealed either just an empty cave or else a macaque. But more importantly, new pieces of scientific evidence revealed factors that made the connection increasingly implausible by making evolutionary explanations increasingly more likely. For example, the biggest factor was the revision of the date that moved the Hobbit's disappearance in time back from about 12,000 years to all the way back to 50,000 years. While oral legends, some researchers are trying to suggest, may go back as far as 8,000 years, which is amazing, um, the idea that they could be stretched to 50,000 is a whole other story in terms of human generations and the accuracy of that kind of storytelling. Additionally, and I, don't, my, I seem to have deleted my image here, so I'm gonna need you to work with me on imagining this. <laughs> Increased examinations of the LB1 bones made the evolutionary affiliation closer to those more primitive hominins that Brown had originally thought the specimen resembled, those living in Africa. And for an imaginary picture, I need you to work with me and imagine the sacrum, a cast of it, of Lucy, and the ilium of Homo floresiensis. 
And Bill Jungers, a paleoanthropologist, brought a cast of that sacrum to Jakarta when he went to study the bones, and they fit like a glove. And so I mention this because, to some extent, the more that creature starts to look like our ancestors, the more it becomes improbable that it's a coincidence of some other species still living on the island of Flores. And again, remember these are ancestors living millions of years ago. So that gap in time is quite shocking. But now we're back to pictures. The third reason why the Ibu Gogo and the Homo floresiensis picture started to fall apart a little bit is a clearer picture of the hobbit's world at the cave of Liangbua. And I don't have time to go into all of the detail today, but essentially, the more the team looked at the other creatures that were living alongside the hobbit, the more they saw that really interesting evolutionary things were going on on this island across the board, including creatures of unusual size. So these are what we call at the Liangbua Cave the Big Five, including giant rats, a giant Malibu stork, a pygmy elephant, and the Komodo dragons that are still alive on the Komodo Islands and on Flores today. So I think what this shows us is that evolutionary stories have played out on this island in interesting ways that might make more sense of Homo floresiensis rather than Ibu Gogo. And here's another slide of that Malibu stork, because just like Homo floresiensis, it has only been found in the cave of Liangbua so far. And it was 1.8 meters tall, which would have been absolutely enormous to the small Homo floresiensis. But okay, so where does this really leave us? And what I'm trying to argue here is that while the connection between Homo floresiensis and Ibu Gogo might not be factually accurate, it didn't really work out in the end, I think it's still relevant because it has something to teach us about the assumptions that we're bringing to our study of the past. And these questions are not going away, actually. The questions of who Homo floresiensis is and whether or not they're still living on the island. In the time that I was preparing for this talk, a new book came out by the same researcher, Gregory Forth, which made headlines all around the world, arguing that Homo floresiensis is indeed still alive and will be found someday on the island of Flores. So I bring this up because I think it really forces us to ask if this keeps coming up and if this question isn't going away anytime soon, and if the news loves it as much as they do, what can we take from this discussion? And particularly, I think we can use it to reflect on A, those assumptions, and B, how the science of paleoanthropology has changed. changed. Now, I haven't had a lot of time to talk about this specifically, but hopefully you've gotten a little bit of a flavor of some of the things that were covered earlier this morning about brain size. If I had to say two major assumptions that Homo floresiensis challenged, one is that brain size is directly correlated with advanced behaviors, including stone tool technology. Some of the Australopith tools that we saw this morning, those were discoveries that have happened after Homo floresiensis. So when this was announced in 2004, the idea that a creature with a brain this small could make stone tools was still quite novel. Additionally, and more importantly, I think, again, reflecting on that issue of the diversity of the human family tree in the recent past when our own species has been running around is a really interesting evidence. And indeed, we now are a really interesting exercise. And indeed, we now have further evidence that this recent past was populated by many other species of hominins. And so how can we understand our place in nature in that larger picture? And this is something that the fantastic specimen of LB1 really helped pave the way for. And so maybe the significance of the intertwined stories of Homo floresiensis and Ibu Gogo is the realization that scientific discoveries, particularly the unexpected ones, have the power to transform the way that we think about the past. By confronting scientists with something so unforeseen and overturning some of those assumptions, these small bones opened the door for really big speculation. Homo floresiensis revealed that the past was potentially more bizarre than we could have imagined, full of evolutionary hodgepodges in the recent past and life in surprising places. Might we then be careful with our assumptions moving forward? And with that, I want to say thank you specifically to the Ling Bua team for a lot of these images today and also for allowing a historian to join their team for the last few years. 
And I also want to say thanks to my late PhD supervisor, Bill Kimball, a fantastic paleoanthropologist in his own right, who has not only made all of my work possible, but has always made it better. So thank you. <laughs>